Well, I'm not sure I'm capable to talk about my legacy, but I can tell you that I came to Uganda back in 1963. And my dad, in fact, was an industrial chemist. Um, but all of my holidays, my school holidays, were spent in this part of the world. And funny thing is, and until the 1990s when I came back to Uganda, I'd never been to Western Uganda. All my safaris and all my holidays were here in Southern Karamoja and right the way up into Kadepo. So this is a part of Uganda, the eastern forgotten part of Uganda sometimes, that I've always loved and had a special place for in my heart. That's a very good question. You know, I think it's, it's something to do with the wildness of this place and the nobility of the people. And I often think, I've, I've done a lot of safaris in Masai Mara and Samburu land in Kenya, which is just over the borders actually from here. But you know that the Karamojong are a very special and noble people similar to the Masai. And they've got an incredible history and incredible culture. And I think that's something that always inspired me and I always loved about this place. Plus, I mean, if you look around, I'm, I'm sitting in the middle of a savanna. Mount Elgon is behind me, 14 and a half thousand feet. Mount Debassin, or Kadam as it's now called, is over on that side. Over on the other side, you've got Mount Napak. I mean, how can you sit in a place in the middle of nowhere and see three magnificent mountains that have all got their own stories about them? In Uganda in the 1960s, no, nobody, no, no normal people had four-wheel drives. It was the government or the police. Everybody drove around the whole of the country in a normal sedan. My dad used to take us on safari in a Peugeot 404. And all the years he drove that Peugeot 404, he never had a problem with it. He never broke a spring or burst a tire. The only thing that ever happened was, in fact, he had a, a stone went through his radiator once. The only thing that happened. Up here in Karamoja, we used to come in a Peugeot 403 pickup. Up until about six o'clock in the evening, we'd drive along. Because there wasn't the, the population in those days. And at six o'clock, we'd drive off the road into the bush. Two bedrolls in the back of the pickup go to sleep, wake up in the morning, cup of tea or coffee, and get going again. Yeah, towards the end of last year, we did a ride called the Tour of Karamoja, and um, I've seen a lot in Africa. I've seen Maasai ceremonies, I've seen Samburu ceremonies, um, I've seen the Karamojong, and I've seen the Turkana. But one thing, and, and this is the strange thing about Africa, something always spe special happens on a safari. We went over the top of this hill, we went down into a valley, on one side of the road, I saw the Karamojong, and the other side of the road, I saw the Turkana, two incredibly cultured tribes, and they were friends. I read in the newspaper, oh, the Karamojong are fighting, the Turkana are fighting. There we went to a place where the Karamojong and the Turkana were side by side, and they both danced to welcome us into their community. I mean, every day you learn something. I mean, I'm 62 years old now, and every day I still learn something different about Africa. So that's why it's, it is a very special place. You can never predict. I can't say to you, come on safari, I'll show you a lion, I'll show you a leopard, I'll show you a cheetah. And those animals are all around here somewhere. You can never guarantee, it's not the zoo. You don't know who you're gonna meet. I mean, a few days ago, I met an elder here from this area of Pianupe in Southern Karamoja. And we started talking. It turns out I know his brother. His brother's a minister in Kampala. And he said, well, how do you know my brother? I mean, Africa is a huge continent, but sometimes it's really small. For me, the perfect safari is a combination of everything. The first thing about Africa, the first thing about Uganda, the first thing about Karamoja, is the weather is always perfect. Uh, you can, it doesn't matter. You come any time of the year here. It's not like other, other regions of East Africa where you can't go in April because you're gonna spend five hours stuck in the mud. You can come to Karamoja any time you like. I like to sleep in the bush. Camping in the bush is for me the ultimate African experience. I was sitting down yesterday and I saw a herd of eland walk past. Sometimes you don't have to go and chase the bush. Sitting in your camp and watching a herd of animals come to you rather than you go to them is very special. Sleeping under a canvas at night and listening to the African sounds, listening to the hyenas call listening to a lion and realizing that lion's call is coming from six kilometers away and it's as if it's next to your tent. Those are special things you, you can't get at the Four Seasons Hotel in Dallas. Well, this is what people have found. Over the years, initially, in the 1960s, people came to Africa to hunt. In the 1980s, people came into Africa to do photo safaris. But now people are starting to realize that 
all of the different African tribes, and there's so many tribes throughout the whole of the continent of Africa, all of these different tribes, they have their special individual customs. Whether it's slaughtering a bull to move into the state of being an elder, whether it's uh, moving your cows around, whether it's dancing to see who can dance the highest to get the most beautiful girl in marriage. I mean, every tribe has its own culture. Some tribes worship fish, some tribes worship cows. The Karamajong, they worship their cows, they look after their cows, their cows are their wealth. But there's also the history that's written down, the history in rocks too, not too far away from here that's been etched into the side of caves so the youngsters can remember what the elders are talking about. For me, I, I can only think that the reason I, I love Karamoja is because I went to boarding school in Kenya and when we came home, we had four, five week holidays. And the biggest high spot of my holidays was knowing that I was gonna go on safari. There's a road not too far away from here, just along there, which goes from Mbali, which was the administrative capital of the East, right the way up to Nakipiripirit, then up to Moroto. That, that was my holiday route. I grew up on that road. I loved that road. I, we would drive along and I'd look off to the side and you could just see the ears of a cheetah popping out through above this long grass and you, ah, you'd stop the car. There's a cheetah. Ah, and there's another one. So I suppose for me, it's, it's the childhood memories. I mean, I've been coming to this part of Uganda for 50 years. I know every turn in the road and I know what it's got to offer. I'd, it's a very hard thing to explain something that's in your heart and in your mind why? Why? I, I can't tell you why actually, but I think the Karamajong people have something to do with that. Because I'll tell you one small story. If I make a promise to a Karamajong and I die, my son inherits that promise. He has to fulfill the promise to the elder. And that's, there's not very many people in this world today still have that nobility. I can say the Maasai, I can say the Samburu, and the Karamajong, it's, and it's an extremely important trait that I think very often in the modern world, we don't have anymore. Well, uh, Yaru Kaguta Museveni did a phenomenal job. The guns came into Karamoja, and I don't like to talk about the unstable time, but it's important. The guns came into Karamoja because of Idi Amin, who uh, commanded this country, if you like, in the 1970s. He looked down on the Karamajal. He called them savages. You can't call a noble people savages. And so they armed themselves and for a long time they they swapped their spears and their bows and arrows for AK-47s. And then they would war with the Pokot and the Turkana. Kaguto Museveni, our president, said, right, we've got to get rid of guns. We have to have peace if this region is to develop. And I came back here again about 10 years ago and I said, well, Where's the guns? The guns have gone. The people have gone back to their spears and bows and arrows to protect their cows. And so I can see now with the peace that's now come back to this region, the development. To the north of this region, Karamoja, there's a park called Kidepo, which was surveyed in the 1950s. And I can tell you, you will not see herds of buffalo anywhere else in Africa like that. I mean, I've seen a lot. But there, you have herds of buffalo between three and 5,000. I mean, two kilometers of buffalo are going to water. I mean, this place is going to open up. It's easier. We used to think it was such a long way to Kidepo. Kidepo was a two hour, a two day drive from Kampala. Now you can get there in eight hours. This, this region is going to open up for tourism to see wildlife, I mean, a lot of people come to Africa for the view, the beauty of this place. You don't have to see an animal sometimes. You just look at the mountains, you look at the changing light during the day. But also, they'll come to this region because the Karamajong have been left behind because of the conflict with Idi Amin, and they're now catching up. The Karamajong will have the same reputation in a few years' time as the Maasai do in Kenya. You know, if there's one thing I would say to anybody, if you've been to Africa, you've got to come to Karamoja.
it's a magical place. I can't explain why it's magical. I have to bring you here. I have to show you. I'll take you up the road. I'll take you along the roads to Moroto and Kidepo. I'll point out 5,000 buffalo. And then I'll take you into a corral and you see people milking their cows, bringing the cows in during the, the late part of the evening to put thorn trees around their corral to protect their cows from the lions that are certainly going to try and come in the night. That has been going on for a thousand years. I'd be pretty keen to take you up there and show you. 